Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We are glad that you have joined us here in the sanctuary. And uh, for those at home, uh, we want to welcome you as well, or wherever it is that you are this morning. We're glad that you are worshiping with us. Uh, before we start our worship service this morning, I just want to make a couple of introductions and let you know who some people are here, because there's some new faces among us this morning. Sitting at the keyboard this morning is my son, Colin. Colin is filling in for Dan. Dan had his second vaccine yesterday, and uh, as a precaution, he's doing fine, but as a precaution, uh, we made sure that Colin was available to play today in case Dan was a little under the weather. Uh, he's probably home in bed, Lisa said, just, uh, you know, sipping tea or drinking coffee and relaxing and uh, whining. Yes, that too. <laughs> Uh, if he's watching, we know that you're home whining, Dan. That's okay. And, uh, and we're glad that he had his second shot. How many folks here have had at least one COVID vaccine so far? Good. How many people have had two already? Awesome. We are on track, friends. Remember, our goal is, one of them, that uh, we're going to be singing the Easter hymns here on Easter morning. As more and more of our congregation gets vaccinated and we wear our face masks, uh, we can sing the Easter hymns here in the sanctuary on Sunday, and that's what uh, we are hoping to do on Easter. The other new person I want to introduce you to is actually sitting behind the camera over there. That is Stephen Long. And uh, Stephen is a new staff member here at Emmanuel. He's going to be doing our videography work here in the sanctuary for this 10 o'clock service and uh, getting us on Facebook Live and helping to then upload the service to YouTube for us. And uh, today's Stephen's first day, so be nice to him. Don't scare him away. And uh, you will see him set up somewhere here. We're, we're talking about locations for cameras and things like that in the coming weeks. But uh, Stephen has joined our staff and we are glad that he is, uh, is here to guide us through the uh, ever-growing uh, virtual ministry that Emmanuel is doing. Well, today is Sunday, March 14th, and it is uh, the fourth Sunday in Lent. And uh, we are uh, going to hear today perhaps one of the, uh, the most famous uh, words from Scripture that uh, almost everybody has committed to memory, I'm sure. Um, and, and you're going to hear those and you're going to say, oh, I remember that. And, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. That always presents a challenge for a pastor, preaching on a, a text that you probably know as well as I do. And some of you might know better because you've uh, heard it longer. Um, but uh, my message is entitled, Into God's Way of Love. During this service, we'll uh, have some wonderful special music that Ben is going to provide for us this morning. There'll be a time of a Lenten centering, which will be a little bit different for us today, and a time of confession, as we have been doing each Sunday during Lent. And at the end of our worship service today, we'll be sharing some God sightings, uh, things that happened in our lives during the week that, uh, that uh, we realized were the hand of God at work. And uh, you'll have the chance to share those. So uh, if you have a God sighting from this week, why uh, you'll be thinking about it. And, uh, and we'll get to hear a little bit about it in uh, just a few minutes. So I want to invite you now to uh, join with us in the responsive call to worship that is on the screens in front of you. Beloved in Christ, why have you come to worship this morning? We have come to celebrate the love of God in the form of Jesus Christ. This love reaches through the shadows of our lives to embrace us. Our challenge is to trust the light of God's love in the midst of our struggles. We come to celebrate the light of God in Jesus, who offers love and acceptance, not judgment and rejection. If only we will trust, Jesus leads us in the way of light and love. We come to celebrate our God who loved and loves us so much. We're going to pause now for a time of uh, centering. This is a little bit different than an opening prayer uh, because I want to invite you to kind of get comfortable where you are in your seat and uh, to close your eyes and, uh, and let's center ourselves for this worship service.
visualize, if you would, a place of emptiness, a place of shadows. And imagine your presence in that place. Now imagine that with you is the presence of Jesus as a glimmer of light. What does that light look like? Stay there for a moment with Jesus the light. As you focus your attention on that glimmer of light, hear these words. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten child. For God so loved the world that God gave. For God so loved the world. For God so loved. So loved. The world. God. Amen. Listen now as we hear this morning's opening songs.
Today is a, uh, an anniversary of sorts. It was uh, 12 months ago today that I stood in the sanctuary and uh, told you that we were going to cease operations in the building for a couple of weeks until the pandemic numbers went down. And tomorrow, March 15th, is the day last year that I started writing those daily chimings that you have received in your email all these 12 months. We were, um, we were shut down pretty much for the rest of 2020 in one way or another. And uh, as we now hit this 12 month period, um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, our fervent prayer is that it's not a train coming at us, uh, but rather the rise of vaccines and the drop of an infection rate in our community uh, and in communities around the world. But I am, uh, I am really cognizant of the fact that 12 months has gone by. And uh, according to Johns Hopkins, uh, in these 12 months, some 29 million Americans have contracted COVID-19. And I think now we are at the point after 12 months where everyone here in this room and everyone watching at home knows somebody who has had COVID-19. And during these 12 months, as of midnight last night, some 534,291 Americans have lost their battle with COVID. They are our families and our friends. They are members of our communities and members of our churches. They are folks we know and love and miss. And I want to invite you to pause with me for a moment here so that we can uh, offer a word of prayer for those 534,291 and their families. Oh God, it has been a long and often difficult 12 months that we have been in this battle, that we have been in this pandemic. Sometimes, oh God, we uh, we complain about wearing a face mask or having to remain physically distanced or being unable to shake a hand or hug. But we know that this morning for more than 500,000 families in our country, the grief goes much deeper. We have lost ones that we loved, ones that we knew. We have lost many who have died alone and families have not been able to properly mark the passing of their loved ones. We lift all of those families to you now We pray for those who desperately miss someone around their dinner table. 
or at their next family gathering. We thank you for those who have served and continue to serve as first responders, for medical professionals, for those who teach and work in our schools, and our offices and all the other institutions of our life. We pray that this vaccine process might uh, be a speedy one so that we might return to some sense of normalcy. But when we do, keep us always mindful of those who you have called home and help us to be ones who reach out to others. And we pray this today in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, during Lent, we have uh, paused each Sunday for a time of confession. And we're going to do that again this morning with a, a prayer for reconciliation. O God of comfort and God of challenge, we come to you this morning the way the Israelites did, full of complaints and dissatisfaction. Nothing is enough. We do not recognize your blessing at work in our day-to-day -day lives. Forgive us in our complaints. Challenge us, as you did the Israelites, to consider the bigger picture of oppression injustice and inequality around us. Forgive us when we close our eyes for fear of what you might show us. Lift up loving and compassionate leaders to open our eyes until we see what you see in our world. You, friends, are blessed because God's image resides within each one of you. And so I pray that you will return God's blessing by the way that you love others. Amen. I want to invite you now to listen as Darlene reads for us this morning's scripture lessons. Good morning. Good morning. The first reading is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, made alive in Christ. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do, God, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
The second reading is John 3, verses 14 through 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the man, Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. Ben has uh, prepared some special music for us this morning, and I invite you to, uh, to sit back and enjoy that now.
Thank you, Ben. That was great. Will you join your heart with mine in prayer? Oh God, this morning I pray that the words that come from my lips and indeed the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing to you. And we pray this this morning in the powerful and precious and holy name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, today I want to uh, reflect a little bit on God's love for us and God's promise of eternal life that's made known to us in Jesus' death and resurrection. And I want to acknowledge, as I said before, that our verses from John's Gospel today I think are the best known and most used verse in the entire Bible. Especially that 16th verse that says, For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son, that to everyone who believes in Him may not perish, but have eternal life. In fact, those words are part of the communion liturgy in many churches today. And they can be found, I think, emblazoned across church advertisements, especially during fundraising campaigns. And if we stop to think about it, and if we took the time to look, we might find that those words are considered to be at the very heart of the gospel. The gospel in a nutshell, as it were. In fact, in the front of the Bibles, the millions and millions of Bibles that are provided to hotels, hospitals, schools, prisons by an organization called Gideon's International, we would find that that text is printed inside the cover of that Bible and has been printed in some 25 different languages around the world. John 3.16 tells all who read its words that God so loved the world that God gave his only son, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. That's an incredible thought. It's an incredible reality. But before, I think, we try to consider or to reflect on the amazing power and the impact that those words have had on all of those who will read them or hear them, I want to first try to kind of consider the background of the whole passage in which those words come. We remember from the beginning of that third chapter of John's Gospel the story of the Pharisee called Nicodemus. And he came to Jesus for a visit under the dark of night. His visit took place at night, I think, maybe because he was uncertain and cautious, but also, I think, because he was afraid to be seen by his fellow Pharisees talking to Jesus. Because as a group, you know, the Pharisees disagreed with just about everything Jesus said and did. In fact, we could say that Jesus had been pretty unpopular with those Pharisees. But Nicodemus is different. He had seen, and, and maybe more than seen, he had sensed that something unique and special was about Jesus. About what he said and about what he did. And as the two of them spoke that night in the darkness, Nicodemus is touched very deeply by the one that many people had come to call the Messiah. He recognizes that Jesus has the authority and the guidance of God in what he says and what he does. He feels that the, the new movement that has grown around Jesus was indeed from God. And Nicodemus' approach and his words to Jesus that night were polite and they were reverent. And yet Jesus responds 
with words of urgency. Jesus says to his nighttime visitor that there's no time to waste. If Nicodemus was seeking the kingdom of God, he needed to make a new start right now. He needed to be reborn, born again from above. And to give emphasis to what he says, Jesus starts out this text by reminding Nicodemus of an event in the time of Moses, which we find recorded in our scriptures in the book of Numbers. Here, great serpents had bitten and killed many of the Israelite people, whom Moses was leading during their escape from slavery in Egypt towards the freedom of the promised land. And the people turned to Moses for help and guidance. And he told the anxious, frightened people that he would fix a bronze replica of a serpent up on a staff. And those who were bitten by a snake in the wilderness should gaze at that staff so that they would survive the venomous bite and live. And here in this story with Nicodemus, Jesus is clearly making the serpent story from Numbers a parable about his own death on the cross. As Moses fixed the image of a servant on a staff, so Jesus would be fixed up on a cross and he would die to heal, to restore our relationship with God. All these years later, that symbol of a serpent on a staff is still a symbol for healing. And continuing with the idea of the parable to which the story lends itself, the dying crucified Son of God should be gazed upon and loved by all people. For it is by looking upon and loving and believing in the crucified Jesus that all people can be saved, can be restored, and can be healed. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That's what Jesus said. So then, in what way do these words of John 3.16 have an impact, an effect on us today? Well, there are no doubt, I think, countless people who could testify to the powerful influence that those words have had on their personal life and on their faith. Words that would seep into the very depths of our minds and our hearts and which are absorbed into their whole being. Such people might tell us that, that they somehow grasped the significance of the words for themselves with such certainty that they felt compelled to respond to them with a conviction and a faith that to this day has never left them. How? Simply by reading some words on a sheet of paper can we understand how the words of John 3.16 have so powerfully affected the lives and personal convictions of so many. Well, here is one way. I'm going to ask you this morning to consider, to reflect upon, and to apply these words to yourself, as if Jesus were addressing you as the only person in the world that mattered. So try these words on for size. God so loved the world, loved you that God gave his only son so that you who believe in him might not perish but might have eternal life. That is, you who believe. 
you who trust and have confidence and hope in Christ Jesus, the one who hung up there on that cross and died for you personally and now requires you to turn and to face him. It is all for you to make a conscious, individual decision in faith to turn toward Jesus. It is all for you that he died personally. Yes, deciding to turn towards Jesus in faith and with commitment as he hung there on that cross is perhaps the easiest and the most difficult thing for us to do. But it still has to be done. It has to be done because here lies our assurance, the promise of God, that no matter how hard the journey of our life becomes, no matter how challenging our Christian life journey might be, in our turning toward the crucified Christ, we find the source of eternal life. Because God transforms, or as our scripture calls it, transfigures the pain and the anguish of a brutal death up there on that cross into the wonder and the brilliance and the freedom of resurrection, new life. So for us today, when it comes down to it, as we relate to the people in the wilderness and they're journeying toward the promised land with Moses, as we relate our own traveling to the uncertainty of Nicodemus, as he visited Jesus in the darkness of the night. So Jesus says the same words to us about our time of darkness and trial. God loves us and gave Jesus his only son so that if we have faith in him, he will not allow us to perish along the way, but instead will accompany us to eternal life. Yes, let's gaze on the love of God for us, made known to us in Christ Jesus on the cross. But friends, let us not dwell on the darkness and on the death, but instead on the new life of the resurrection that Jesus leads us to in our own faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to move now to a time of prayer, and Lisa and Colin have prepared a piece of music to move us into that time together. Jesus, we are so thankful for how you love us, for how you love us in extraordinary ways. We're thankful that you gave yourself for us, 
for us as a world and for us as individuals. We're so blessed that you chose that path so that we might live our lives in faith and with joy. We know that today, oh God, we, we bring lots of concerns with us. Within the sound of my voice are people whose lives have been changed during these last 12 months. There are those at home watching this worship service who, who fear leaving their homes. There are those whose jobs have ended. And there are those in hospitals and at home who are under quarantine seeking to be physically healed. We also know that there are any other lots of other situations in our lives that we want to bring to you. We think about folks who are going through cancer treatments or those who are sick in any way. We think about those who are in prison, those who are far away from loved ones as they serve. We think about those who this morning are, are working because they're first responders or they're doctors or they're nurses. We ask you to watch over them all, keep them safe. And now, oh God, we come to you with the prayers of our hearts and we'll lift those prayers to you, either with the words of our lips or with the words of our hearts. However we choose to pray to you, God, we know you're gonna hear our prayers. So here in this time here, the prayers of your people. God, when Jesus was here, he gave us words to pray. He taught us to pray when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we have each, uh, each Sunday during Lent, we have, uh, we have talked about God sightings. And we have talked about how it is that, uh, that we have seen God act in the world and uh, in our lives. And I'm wondering this morning if there are, uh, are some who might like to uh, share one of their God sightings that happened during the week. <laughs> well, you could use this one. There you go. I actually have a great God sighting of our grandchild, uh, Rhett Franklin, being born this past weekend. <laughs> That was a, a wonderful God sighting, the arrival of new life in the family. Thanks be to God for that. Who else has had a God sighting this week? Something that happened in their life when you just went, whoa, that was God. Barb Lind, I'm coming. Let me mask up here to make sure we keep everybody healthy. Barb, tell us about your God sighting. Well, uh, Ralph and I were scheduled to move to senior housing, and uh, we uh, saw the we saw the truth that we weren't quite ready to go. So we changed our minds, and we're staying in our little old house. Okay. With our three little old pets. With your three little old pets. Right. Well, that was a God sighting, wasn't it? God it was. directed you in the way that, uh, that you and Ralph should go. Other God sightings. We want to welcome back Barb Blanchard for the first time in worship for a year, right? 
That's a God sighting, people coming back to worship. Any other God sightings we want to share this morning? Oh, over here. Coming over. You got to get this right up close to your mouth. Just a quick one. Yep. Obviously, I work at my home office now, mm -hmm. which is a bedroom that we just converted. And I was on a conference call, and I kept on hearing this tapping noise. And I couldn't figure out what the tapping noise was. And when I went to the window, it was actually a beautiful bird. It was blue, but it wasn't a blue jay. I don't know what uh -huh. the bird was. But anyways, tapping on the window, and we looked out, and there was three little birds up on our like, oh, cool. Cutter. It was just, it was a neat little sign that spring was here and a God sighting, and spring was on its way anyway. That's great. A wonderful God sighting. I saw crocuses breaking through the ground in our garden the other day. Of course, they're hiding again now. Lisa. Lorraine Campbell comments that her God sighting happened on the morning of her surgery, and she woke up with a, a tune in her head, and, and after she got out of the shower, it was stronger, and, and then the words came to her, it was, it is well with my soul. I knew then my surgery was going to be okay because God was with me. And I think it went well. It did go very well, yes. Lorene had successful surgery, humming, it is well with my soul, as they wheeled her into the operating suite. Well, those are God sightings, and uh, we have been, uh, we've been thinking about those all through Lent. And uh, some of us have been using the little boxes, the uh, gratitude boxes out there. I think it's been a wonderful, uh, for me, to take the time each day before I go to bed to pause and to think about where God was active in my life as I put a little gift into that gratitude box. Because I know that what's in that gratitude box is going to be used to feed hungry people here in Camillus. Uh, through our neighborhood food pantry located over at St. Joe's, we're going to be uh, supporting that pantry with all of our gifts that we, uh, we gather on Easter when all of those boxes come back. And uh, we are most thankful for those gifts and for the God sightings that uh, have inspired them. Now, some announcements I want to lift up for you this morning. Uh, we want to remember that uh, Phyllis is uh, taking Easter flower orders after worship right out in the uh, narthex. If you want to order an Easter flower to decorate our altar, uh, you'll remember this. We used to do it years ago because we didn't do it last year. We weren't here. But we're going to do it this year. Uh, so if you want to order a flower in honor or in memory of someone in your life, see Phyllis this morning after worship. And if you're watching from home and you want to do that, you can find the order form for Easter flowers on our church website. Just check it out there and you'll be able to order right there. We want to thank all of you who are at home, who are supporting our ministry. Uh, folks are using the donate button on our church website. We appreciate that, and uh, it's allowing us to continue to do the ministry we do. And speaking just to the folks at home now, you folks here just kind of toned me out. If you're watching on Facebook this morning, why don't you just comment and uh, let us know that you're there. Give us a heart or a praying hands or a, uh, just uh, say hi, and uh, we'll be glad to know that you're there. And if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to want to subscribe to our YouTube page by clicking somewhere down around here the subscribe button. And next to it, there's a little bell. If you click on the little bell, every time we load something up to YouTube, you'll get a reminder on your device that we have done so, so that you can stay current with us here at Emmanuel. Uh, we're going to have this morning a, uh, a time for healing prayer. I'm going to start doing this this morning, immediately following the uh, words of benediction. If you have a prayer concern or want to spend uh, a moment or two with me in individual prayer, I'm going to invite you to come up here in these front seats right here on this side, and we'll have a, a brief time of prayer right here at the altar rail, and uh, we'll see how this goes. And uh, if you have a need, uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that we are spending time in prayer for your needs. We also want to talk about uh, possible new member Sunday here at Emmanuel. Uh, we've had some folks visiting with us over the course of uh, the last 12 months, uh, some folks from home and some folks here in the sanctuary. And uh, if you are ready to talk about membership here at Emmanuel, uh, seek me out. You can either talk to me after the service or send me an email at pastorjackk at gmail, and uh, I'll be glad to talk to you about uh, membership and uh, what uh, is involved in becoming a member of this congregation. Let me just go over some uh, Holy Week plans for you as well. On Palm Sunday, we're going to celebrate Palm slash 
Passion Sunday this year. So we will start with the traditional Palm Sunday entry into Jerusalem, and we'll sing the hymns and have the, uh, or no, we won't sing the hymns, you'll listen to the hymns on Palm Sunday, almost got me there. And you'll have a palm that you can wave, and uh, and we'll start out the service that way, and at the end of the service, we'll end the service with a reading of the Passion Story. But it'll move us into Holy Week. Uh, on Monday, Thursday, April 1st, we'll gather here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock at night for a service of Holy Communion. And uh, that service will also be live streamed for folks watching at home at 7 o'clock on uh, Monday, Thursday. On Good Friday, April 2nd, the sanctuary will be open from 12 to 3 for your individual times of prayer. If you want to come over and spend a few minutes in the sanctuary on Good Friday afternoon, uh, I'll be here. The building will be open from 12 to 3, and you're invited to come into the sanctuary and stay as long as you would like to that day. On Easter Sunday, we will worship here in the sanctuary at 8.30 and 10. And uh, just a reminder that we, have, uh, a, we can get about 70 people into this sanctuary. Maybe a few extras in the narthex. We've got to see if there are groups of two, three, or four who come, or one. That kind of affects how many we can seat. But on both Palm Sunday and Easter, we're going to have overflow seating available in the fellowship hall. And the service will be Facebook live up there. So uh, if you want to make sure that you get a seat in the sanctuary, it would behoove you to set your alarm clock a little bit early on Palm Sunday and Easter to make sure you're here and uh, get a seat. Or join the bell choir because they have seats up here and, uh, and you can be assured of getting a seat that way. Uh, we, we're going to do everything that we can do to welcome everybody in for Easter without turning anybody away. That's what we're trying to do this year, and uh, we appreciate you doing that. Uh, we also are hoping, as I said at the beginning of the service, that on Easter we will be singing Easter hymns behind our masks uh, so that uh, for the first time in a year we will be able to sing the great hymns of our faith here in worship. I know that Darlene wants to give us an update on her, uh, little Rhett and how he is doing at the hospital. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, during uh, God sightings, we did welcome uh, little Rhett Franklin Lacombe into our lives uh, this past weekend. Uh, he started out doing really good in the room with Jamie. Uh, however, after one day, he uh, encountered some breathing issues uh, where uh, he was not able to breathe correctly and was placed into NICU. Uh, when I spoke with Jamie yesterday, uh, they said that as long as his O2 levels uh, did not drop between yesterday and this afternoon, that he would be released. I have not yet heard from Jamie, so I don't know uh, what the update is at the moment, but as soon as I hear that he's home or whatever's going on, I will update Jack and Pam and have them send out a family news. But at this time, I ask that everyone please keep them all in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, Jamie is still up at the hospital. Although she was discharged as a patient during the week, uh, she is not allowed to go outside the building because of COVID. And uh, needs to be there with with little Rut. Thank you. I also wanted uh, one more thing to remind you that today is UMCOR Sunday. The envelopes are on a little stand right out there outside the door if you haven't yet had a chance to use one. The United Methodist Committee on Relief is often the first agency to arrive at the scene of a disaster and uh, if you want to be involved in supporting that work 100 percent of your gift will go to supporting the work of umcor so uh, just grab one of these little brochures and it turns into a handy envelope in which you can put your gift and leave it out there in the offering plate and we would appreciate it all right we're going to listen as lisa sings our closing song this morning and then i'll offer you some words of benediction Thank you. 
If you're able, will you stand and receive this morning's words of benediction? Friends, let us rejoice because God so loves the world. May God, your maker, send you back out into the world with creative energies that are refreshed. May Christ, the light, illuminate your fearful moments. And may the Holy Spirit of steadfast love guide you until we worship together again, this day and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week, friends. Thank you.